at his presentation. Hello, good day, everybody. I hope everybody is having a good day so far. And I'm going to be doing just a little introduction on the white tail there. So as I've mentioned, I am part of the invasive, alien invasive species um, group. Um, we report to the management authority, which is NEPO. Um, our chairperson is Ms. Joni Jackson. And we have another uh, deputy, um, which is Dr. Sean Townsend. So our mandate is to make recommendation on both plants and animals which are invasive species in Jamaica. So I start off with the white tail there. So um, as we know, Odysseus virginianus, which is the virgin of deer, the white tail deer, native to the America, there is 26 subspecies and 17 is reported in North America. It's di dichromatic, meaning that it basically see two color, can distinguish orange and red, and we humans are trichromatic, meaning that we can see it. So that why, when you look at North America, you see a lot of people in orange because the deer cannot really distinguish orange, and it's basically a safety issue. Reason why they call it white-tailed deer when it's alarm, it exposes its tail, as you can see in the picture. Um, they are normally active just around. Dawn and dust, we get a lot of reports in Portland, people seeing them at night. No, we normally can use the antlers to tell about its age, age and nutrition. The bigger the antlers sometimes signify how old the deer is, as you can see in the transition of the pictures. No, a male deer is called a buck. I know the information that we're getting from North America is between 150 to 300 labels. Some Authors show that it goes up to 400. But reports that we are getting so far, people catching up to 120 pounds in Jamaica, the, the weight. The book shed their antlers yearly, and this can be used as to point us to tell us where the deer are. And the lifespan, they live up basically between two to six years, some even longer. The female, which is called a doe, um, normally wear less than the male, and Ranges from like 100 to 50 labels. Lifespan is a little bit longer than the male. And the baby deer is called a fawn. Now, the mating season stuff that we get, we use in North America, which is normally between September to January. The gestation period is relatively about six months. Um, a yearling, the first time she has the fawn, had, um, might have one fawn. But we got anecdotal information in Portland that they are seeing up to two. And females um, a year and two or older have two. But in Portland, again, we get information that they're seeing them with three and maybe more. Because just remember, um, compared to North America that has seasons, um, Jamaica don't have no distinct seasons. So there is abundance of food. So things might change a little. Now, fawns are born normally between May to June in North America. We don't know that here yet. We are doing studies. Um, as you can see to the left, that picture, that's a one day old there. And then we have a three month old. Now, let's go to Jamaica. Now, the, where the deer is found in the Caribbean, it has been introduced to several Caribbean countries. This includes Jamaica, Cuba, Puerto Rico, St. Croix, St. Kitts. In some of these islands, it was intentionally brought there for meat. Um, that's not the case for Jamaica. Now, um, according to the literature, what was reported, we had a touristic facility in Portland. And after Hurricane Gilbert in 1988, roughly six escaped. Some people said some escaped before. But we have in the literature that um, in 1988, um, it was at this touristic um, facility. Just remember that people in North America see there is regular in Jamaica. We don't normally see it. So we kind of said Bambi is here. And locals wanted to see it. So when it got when it escaped, um over here, a farmer report telling me that his crop was being damaged. And then one morning he went out there and he saw a big Bambi walking past. And that's the time he was aware that deer were around. Now, one of the First documentation, a colleague of mine, Chai, in 2000, 
three, she did a study on the distribution of deer within the project area, and she found them in the small farms and forests. Now, this is a map that we have of the area where the deer is found. We have Darley, Industry, Shoeberry, and all of that. And right here is the Blue and Dranko Mountain National Park. So at the time that she, she found it, there's a, um, this area that she found it is about five kilometers from the Blue and Dranko Mountain National Park. Just a reference, there is no barrier stopping them from walking from that area to the park. So we assume that they are there, we just need to do more studies. So after 2003, we start getting more sightings. So we now get um, the spreading. We have got stuff from social media, people showing where they catch, taxi man hit down one, um, somebody saw one in the house in Port Antonio. We got this one where I clipping somebody show what they caught in Boston. And we also got information between the Portland and St. Thomas boundary over the center. They start seeing a few. Interestingly, we also heard about people having private collection of theirs in St. Andrew and in Clarendon. Now, the first question people ask you know, is about the population status. Now we have this paper on St. Matthew's Island where there were about 29 there and over 19 years, the number went up to 6,000. Smaller island than us. Um, similar to Jamaica, I don't have much predators and stuff like that. So if you do the maths, um, Hurricane Gilbert, um, more than 20 something years has passed. We don't have much predators um, after, we don't have no natural predators added there. Possible predator people might have might have been the schoolworm, which you would know it normally affect like young goats and everything. So we think it would affect the deer in that way. But other than that, the only possible predator would have been man. No, in Portland, these this is what is reporting. No, the deer love cash crops, so it eats yam head. It loves carrots, and the guys tell us that it loves the carrot when it's ready to reap. So the deer wait till it. Um, to the left, we have a pumpkin that the deer bite up, and they love um, sweet potato, and sometimes when apples, they come down. So we believe that the population move basically on the availability of the food. Other animals in the area that does that is the wild boar, or what we call the wild pig. Now, this is a local plant, which is called an ag meat. Um, people traditionally feed it to their pigs, so the wild pig love it. And we also use it to trap the deer. So over here, this is normally ag meat. We can differentiate when the wild pig eat it based on how the, the deer nibbles. So this is one of the plants that we find that the deer likes. So when the food, like the crash crops are not eating, we go to local plants. The thing is we need more studies to tell which local plants it is eating because we're not sure. Now, what problems do the, 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 the deer cause from an environmental standpoint? Um, it competes with other herbivores. So we have um, native herbivores that it might have, or native herbivores are possible, like coney. Um, we don't, we're not sure of a conflict there. Um, some of the snails, and you name it. So that's one of the competition. The next thing is it eat native plants, and it's in other countries, it is shown that it's spread invasive. So it eats and then it go in and it spread like invasive plants. These invasive plants would all compete some of our native plants. We have endemic plants which are only found in the Blue and Dranka Mountain and other areas. So that's a, it also in the forest regeneration. So just think of it, if you're eating the small plants, then you won't have no large plants after a while. So how a forest work? As you know, the big tree, you need babies there, which also go up to big trees. So it eats the seedlings and then it's problematic. Next problem, um, it has caused its farming. Now, a number of the small farmers have been impacted um, in terms of their cash crops. Um, the deer will eat corn, it will eat yam head and stuff like that. Some farmers are happy because they can make money from the meat, while others are not happy because they lose a lot. And this rather has been documenting some of it, but we still don't put a monetary figure to, to the impact. Now, how people are controlling the deer, 
So traditionally, we have traps, foot traps, or snares, or some people might call princh, that they normally put along a part that the deer walks, and it, this stick is triggered, and it catch the deer foot. And you go back and catch the deer. So the guys, so here I had a field guide that was carrying us around. He showed us the deer prints. And they put this, and then they go back. We have um, bow hunters and people down there rifle hunting. This, um, there's no law preventing people from hunting the invasive. However, it becomes dicey when you go into a protected area because by right, you are not supposed to display your firearm. I do no hunting in a protected area. They also, different from North America, when we hunt wild pig in Jamaica, we have dogs that go and chase the, the pig out of the bush. Sometimes the dogs um, hold on the, the pig until the hunter comes. So we have bow hunting, we have rifle hunting. But, and another thing that um, some people do, but not on a large scale, they trap. They set feeding traps and the deer will get trapped in it. But what was interesting the other day when we went to a meeting down in um, Portland and talking to some of the stakeholders is that sometimes some of the fishermen also enjoy. So when the wild pig guys, um, sorry, when the hunters with the dogs chasing the deer, they sometimes go in the river, go into, this, um, go into the water, and they might swim out to maybe a mile out there. And then, you know, our, entre our, our fishermen are entrepreneurs. They go and get them out of the water. So I was alarmed to know that they also catch them at sea. The deers are pretty good swimmers. Now, as I stated before, um, currently, um, there is no hunting season for the deer. It is not illegal to hunt it. However, when it comes into a reserve and a sanctuary, um, as it said here, 50 meter no hunting restriction around the boundaries, and you can be fined or locked up. And then the discussion people ask, how you allow hunting of wild pig in these protected areas, and you're going to affect me go, um, as a hunter going in. So that are some issues that has to be sorted out, but that's some of the issues that we find out. Now, what the people are doing, how they utilize the meat. Now you have jerk deer, the, the raw meat itself is sell for between two to $3,000 a pound. Um, the guys jerk it, this we have. Um, they prepare it similar to how we prepare um, goats. So you have curry deer. Um, the difference is what we do, what they do here, um, some of the guys, they prepare the deer like how they would do wild pigs. So in North America, they normally skin the deer. We find some of the hunters, some hunters do skin, but some of the others um, squinch the ear similar to how they do the, the pig. So instead of skinning it, they squinch the ear of the well, I should say the, the deer body. And you, when you go down there, some people make some good manish water as a deer patty, deer steak. So the people are utilizing it. However, so based on what I just talked about there, there were some recommendations. So as in anything, there are conflicts that are developing. And some of the conflicts are between hunters, guides, and farmers. Now, some farmers want no deer. They want the deer to get the deer out. The conservationists would want the deer to, um, to take out the deer. While the people who are the guides who can make between ten dollars to $30,000 a day to carry on a hunter, they see the benefits of the deer being around. So in a way, they would not want all the deer to go away. They might want an area where the deer so they can get more hunters to go there. Uh, because there's so much money to be made, you have a lot of guides coming down and then safety become a problem. Safety in terms of um, the hunters um, using their firearm or bow without injuring themselves, without injuring the touring party and without injuring a farmer in the field. Unlike North America where you can see a couple meters well in the forest. In a tropical forest in Jamaica, you can't see maybe at five meters, you can't see. So imagine if a, a farmer is down there or a community member and a hunter come down. 
So there's a lot of social conflicts that are developing that needs to be solved. Hunters are also concerned about certain stuff with FLA in terms of regulating bow hunting or regulating the firearm. Should I be using slugs? Are we going to be allowed to have scopes, different rifles? All of that need um, a number of social conflicts are coming in because, as you can see, this is a resource. Money is being made. And if you have money being made and people, there are some social conflicts that has to be dealt with. Uh, another issue that has come up, um, strategy to hunt in protected area. When we had the lionfish, we had problems in terms of the lionfish in fish sanctuary. Certain legislation and stuff are changed to allow the fishing in the fish sanctuary. I am not a lawyer. We have a lawyer here. They can go deep into that. People are asking if we could do something similar. I don't know. What is an issue? Because you have the deer don't care whether it's a bird sanctuary or it's a protected area. It just go around. So we have a, a national um, park there that you're not allowed to display a firearm or hunt. We have bird sanctuary in the area and a strategy has to be developed if we're going to control how you got there. But it's an issue. Um, one of the things from the invasive species, alien invasive species group, we find out that there are a number of people um, transporting the deer to other areas in Jamaica. A number of people have contacted me um, asking if they can get a deer. We are trying to put, a, um, put the information out that the deer is slowly spreading into other parts like sentiments. You can imagine if the deer get away in the bread basket like St. Elizabeth and it goes there and in there, it would be a problem. So when people are carrying them around, have them as pet, it's a risk to introduce it at a faster rate to new people. So we are trying, there's nothing in the legislation now that stops that, but it's a problem. We do not want the transportation because um, we would not want it because a big agricultural problem already in Portland. Now there's questions about, should we consume more deer meat or not? It's a wild meat and Ministry of Health would have to give guidance on the eating of wild meat or veterinary in terms of testing or that. So um, you would not hear from me to tell her whether it's safe to consume or not. The good thing with Jamaica is that we overcook our food. So a number of the, the parasites are, I have not seen a study that looks at um, the organism in the deer or stuff like that, but so far, about well, people have been eating it, but we need to look into the public health issue in terms of the meat. Finally, um, we ask people because there are few scientists here, few stakeholders out there. So we ask people if when they cite a deer um, to report it to the relevant agents, NEPA, other agencies. So for example, this is the information that we ask. Where have you seen the deer? How many deer have you seen are if you have hunt? So we need a location, possible sex of the deer, and a picture. And the information can be sent to NEPA. Um, NEPA is on IG, Facebook, and Twitter. If you have a problem, you can send it to um, my contacts there, email, or to Rusa's World. We send this because this is the information that we're using to guide um, the develop management strategies. Some of the stuff that we might be, what we are planning on doing, we're going to be doing some camera trap studies to confirm if they're in the park and to confirm new areas where they're spread. So this is just an introduction um, to the white tail deer in Jamaica. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Damien. That was extremely educational. Uh, we we at NEPA, we have fact sheets and we have some information about the deer, but I know that managing the deer is an ongoing process. And it is helpful to note that the deers are migrating to protected areas and there's no hunting allowed in the areas. 
So the onus is really on people to take the personal responsibility and not to hunt in those areas. And I'm glad we're getting the facts from the experts. And so now I will hand over to Dr. Anthony Di Nicola, president of White Buffalo, so he can start his presentation and give us even more information. Reserve all your questions until the question and answer section. So make note and we'll get to them. Dr. Anthony, over to you. Thank you. Is, it, is my screen being shared properly? Yes, I can see you. One panel share at a time. All right, you should be able to, you should be able to share. Okay, let me see if it's sharing. Is that working? Yes, we can see your screen. Yes, we see your the, the slide view of your PowerPoint. Terrific. All right. Well, Damon, thank you very much for the, the intro. Um, saves me some time and shed some good light on uh, what you all are confronted with down in Jamaica. And I want to thank everyone for inviting me here to speak. And um, I'll try to put context around um, you know what we call our conventional uh, deer methods as well as our what we call non-traditional deer methods which is really outside of using you know recreational hunters so we'll kind of go through some of the similarities and what we've experienced here in the contiguous 48 um, relative to what you're beginning to experience down in Jamaica um, it is unfortunate to hear that uh, um, you have another invasive species established. Um, they're probably not as detrimental as feral pigs, but certainly uh, they can play a role in, in impacts on, on your forest health as well as agricultural concerns. So um, what I wanna do is spend a little time on a higher level overview and then kind of get into the weeds tying into uh, your existing um, we'll call it management or activity around deer harvest um, in, in and around the, the area where they were released. So probably not as much of a problem uh, in Jamaica, but certainly can always be um, just in anywhere where we have high volumes of traffic. Um, I don't know if anyone has really followed what we deal with in the U.S., but uh, deer are not shy of people and they find refuge in um, suburban or developed areas because, you know, not only are they not, you know, natural predators, even humans are limited in their ability to hunt uh, animals in these environments. So the populations escalate and really create a, a hazard for, for vehicles. And uh, so that's probably our number one driving force. And then obviously uh, parallel to your situation, uh, we also have uh, the agricultural uh, interests and the uh, impacts to overall uh, forest health and, and biodiversity. So um, I could see your situation tracking with um, what we've experienced here in the Northeast. And, and some of those vegetational impacts aren't as obvious early on, as you could see in the, in the lower left portion of the screen and lower right portion of the screen, you know, we get what's called a browse line uh, where the deer can forage but with your much more dense vegetation and maybe not as many uh, edges, um, forest edges where it would be evident, you may have extensive uh, vegetational impacts before you really recognize it, unless you're doing um, fairly extensive vegetational surveys on what's being browsed and, and, and what's not. So I know you're considering and or starting some of those, um, those research and, and management initiatives. Um, on, our la on our previous call, we, we spoke on, you know, how do we know how many deer are out there? And, um, and so given your vegetation and its density and visibility and the fact that you're not going to see whether you're on the ground spotlighting or uh, in the air with an aircraft, as, as we often do here in the United States, um, you're really going to have to focus on using infrared cameras, as, as Damon mentioned. 
um, strategically placing those out in grids, collecting your imagery, and, and then extrapolating those pictures into, even if it's rough population estimates, at least you know um, what's out there. And then you can also start to see the extent to which they've expanded. And, uh, and based on Damon's um, reporting uh, methods, you know, if, if you have people um, observing deer, taking photos of deer where they may have been relocated, uh, which is your probably biggest risk right now, um, you can go into those areas, set up cameras and get a sense of if there is an established population uh, where an observation was made. So in the US, um, you know, we've kind of gone from using recreational hunting um, and back when deer populations were getting reestablished, because um, most of our deer back um, in the early colonial days when we stripped all the forests um, and, and we had market hunting, many of the populations were decimated. And so we actively tried to reestablish deer throughout the Eastern United States and in that process, we were controlling the amount of hunting so that the populations can grow. Well, we obviously weren't too smart and didn't foresee the problem of too many deer. And you know, how would we start to um, limit that growth curve and kind of level it off at, a, at a, you know, an appropriate level from an ecological perspective or agricultural um, impact? Um, so, we weren't smart, so our population kept going up, similar to probably what yours is doing, and uh, and then you're trying to fix it when it's already at those elevated levels. So some of the methods we've used to work and control deer outside of hunting, uh, in addition to hunting, recreational hunting we call it, um, you know, is, is professionals uh, shooting deer, and then uh, we also can trap animals, as Damon depicted, and, and maybe some some more elaborate traps. Uh, and euthanizing those animals. Um, and then in our very densely developed areas where you have a lot of social pressure around um, killing animals. So, you know, we're looking at non-lethal, which at this stage, it has no real relevance to, to Jamaica, but just something that, you know, we've had to research here in the US based on deer uh, habituating to people and getting into very densely developed environments. And then what I'd like to speak a little bit more on today is what we call controlled hunting, which is using licensed hunters. So you have to take a safety course um, administered by each state that affords you um, a hunting license and then you pay fees in order to hunt different species. Um, but what we do in these uh, more sensitive areas, whether it's near uh, private properties, agricultural areas, um, forest preserves like you're uh, working with where you don't want to have conflicts between hunters and, and uh, other users. Um, we have oversight on how those programs are implemented and how those hunters are able to access uh, the landscape. Um, and this is kind of a general guide that I use. So in very rural, um, you know, open areas, um, regulated hunting is kind of the method by which we, we regulate deer populations. Uh, and as you get more densely developed or human activity levels, um, we need to manage those hunters. And then we transition to what I'm going to talk about today, where we train volunteers, train volunteer hunters, on how to be more successful so they can actually meet management goals. And then ultimately, we use sharpshooting or professional culling when um, those volunteers are unable or will not have the abilities or equipment uh, or methods afforded to them to be able to kill large numbers of deer in, in very controversial areas like national parks, for example. So there's the white guy with the orange hat um, that Damon was speaking of. And, uh, and all our hunters are required to wear blaze orange. And that is a safety issue around um, being in the woods and ensuring that the public can see the hunter. Um, the conflict obviously is the hunter, you know, the, the, the hiker or the, the farmer isn't wearing orange, so they're not visible. So um, it really limits um, the ability to quote unquote protect non-hunters in the landscape, but at least hunters know uh, where each other are when they're out uh, pursuing game. Um, and so this, regu this regulated hunting, as we call it, um, it's free, right? Hunters can go out, they get permission on properties 
and, um, and they harvest deer, use them to feed their family. And then, um, and also as a form of, it's a big form of recreation for us, very social uh, activity. Uh, the problem with it is um, it's, hap, you know, it's haphazard, right? There's nobody really keeping good track on, on harvest. Uh, there's no way to, to, to ensure the hunters are, are, are aware of their situations they're in. Uh, there's no real accountability for folks in the field. And, um, and we don't even know how competent the, the individuals are with their archery equipment and firearms. So uh, it really is kind of a loose system uh, and isn't really uh, applicable or very effective in, in areas where you are starting to see, as Damon called it, social conflicts between hunters and, and uh, the residents of, of Jamaica. Um, so what I want to talk about is something that I've been advocating here in the US is you know how do we use these uh, hunters, these these interested um, you know recreationalists or sportsmen to actually manage deer, right? Not just have a form of recreation where they get a deer or two for the freezer. Um, it's how do they actually contribute to a meaningful impact to the to those deer populations that are of concern. Uh, so really, you need some entity, right, that would facilitate. Uh, these individuals getting access because if a hunter uh, went up to somebody and knocked on their door and they didn't, and the landowner didn't know that person, they may be skeptical, right? Nervous about whether the person is conscientious or is going to leave the gate open with their livestock. And so it, it often needs to be uh, facilitated so that the hunters can actually get access. Um, and then you need to also kind of bring people together so the non hunters can understand the hunters and hopefully, in a way, you know, they can um, uh, help each other, right? The hunter gets a place to hunt, but the hunter also then uh, kills enough deer um, where that landowner is benefiting um, from that um, activity on their property or, you know, from a government perspective on, on a forest preserve um, or park. So um, Damon mentioned there is some archery hunting and firearm hunting um, intuitively or, or even, you know, from a scientific perspective, you know, in the physics a rifle is far more effective than archery tackle, right? And so if you really wanna have a meaningful impact and not just recreate, you really wanna have folks with firearms out there to kill enough deer to be meaningful. So if you look at the data here in the US, you know, across the country, you know, over 90% of our deer are killed by firearm hunters. And those seasons are very short. Archery season might be three, four or five months long. Hunting is usually a week or two and you still kill multiple fold more deer using firearms. Um, so it's something to consider about safety. And that's what we'll talk about how you might be able to mitigate that, um, you know, by training hunters versus just letting them go out and, and hunt at their own leisure. Um, and ultimately, when you start getting uh, into these more developed areas or even on the farmlands, you, know, you want the public um, to feel comfortable and feel safe um, on their property when there are uh, hunters active. Um, and this is kind of a painful graph that I always share. And, uh, and what it points to is you, know, you really need to think about, you know, having competent hunters or shooters out there because, yeah, it's easy to kill deer when you have a lot of deer. But, you know, when we want to get down to deer numbers that won't be impacting the forests, um, there you need to be down in the you know, the 20 deer per square mile or fewer, and you can see how rapidly the effort to kill a deer increases. And so to get into those lower densities, it takes a lot of labor and, and a lot of effort. And hunters usually quit uh, because they don't wanna put that much time in. They, they wanna go out and get a deer easily and, and, uh, and go home. So um, these are some of the things you need to balance with, with who your participants are and, and how to make sure that they can get to those low densities especially in the forest preserves and parks, you know, to, uh, to protect those native plant species. Um, and so you, I heard some discussions about, you know, changing laws and regulations um, and, and allowing hunting, you know, whether, you know, it was, you know, chasing lionfish and harvesting lionfish and preserves, you know, the same type of thing really needs to be considered and, and they can, needs to be considered soon. Um, it's always great to collect data and understand the situation um, but if you're not paralleling 
the management and the management initiatives and, and legal initiatives with the data collection, by the time you collect your data, you're so far behind, you know, your management is, 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 uh, is really put to the test on whether it can actually solve the problem at that point. You may be there already, but you really need to think about kind of moving all those elements, the legal, the science and the management all together simultaneously, where I think you're really gonna get behind the curve, especially if people are, are translocating deer to other areas. Um, so the key here really is, is, is not just uh, managing for people to recreate, which they're doing now, um, but it's also ensuring that that recreational activity meets the overall community uh, or government objectives. Um, so in order to be successful, um, and this is nothing new and, and, and you, you're very aware of it, is you have to have access. You can't kill deer where um, you don't have access uh, to those properties. And so that, as I mentioned before, really needs to be facilitated between the hunters and the landowners and, and sorting out who is that facilitator. Is that a government person? Is it, is it a local, uh, uh, locally identified individual that has those connections? Um, you know, someone has to screen the hunters, right? We don't want, hunt, you know, you don't want somebody out there that's incompetent with a firearm uh, and then having them introduced to, to landowners, right? It's really not gonna work. Word spreads fast when, when a system is not working. Uh, and it, but it can spread fast to your advantage if, if things are really coordinated well and people are having good experiences. Um, so it's really important to, to make sure that um, integrating um, hunters is a very strategic process. And, and that's where the, the professional element of, of oversight and management comes into play. Um, and, and, I, and I think we had discussed some of the, the social networks uh, in Jamaica. Um, you know, that as there are pretty much everywhere, right? You have these local groups and they communicate with each other and, and it's finding those local leadership uh, folks that can, you know, serve as the interface with that community. And then using those key points of contact to use as spokespeople to communicate with hunters in, in those areas and, and the landowners. So it's trying to think about identifying those key players uh, that can really drive the system and this is the same on any issue, but uh, it is a process. And the sooner you start, the sooner you can get that network established. And, and then from the hunter's perspective, as those densities get lower, you know, they start losing interest. That's what happens here in the US. So that's why the professionals come in because the hunter's like, I'm not gonna go out for four days and not see a deer. Um, and so, um, you know, if those hunters, you know, have uh, facilitated access to properties, um, you know, maybe there's some equipment that can be afforded to them if they're really contributing to the management efforts. Um, and then ultimately, you know, if there's a way to legalize the sale of the venison, so they take ownership of it and sell it, uh, certainly, you know, that would incentivize them to go out and harvest more deer. Um, one of the first steps, even though it seems pretty fundamental, is just making sure these participants have skills, right? They have a, a, a quality uh, equipment, and they know how to use it, right? Because otherwise there's a lot of shooting going on and not a lot of dead deer and, uh, and, the, and the safety risks escalate as, as the relative competency of those people uh, decline. So we strongly advise, whether it's archery or firearms, uh, putting through a, a folks, any participants in a program, do a very regimented screening process for, for their skills. Um, uh, going through education on, you know, what firearms to use and bullets to select so you can ensure that it's safer out there. We don't want to have a big um, caliber gun with a lot of energy that puts more people at risk, where if you have a more precise firearm and a skilled user, you can really reduce the risk to the, to, uh, from a safety perspective uh, and still ensure that animals are killed humanely. Um, and when we start getting into more, especially in agricultural areas, more um, uh, professional end of the spectrum, right? Really getting these trained individuals or professionals um, uh, more uh, successful, you can use um, leftover um, agricultural products, attract you know, some of the, the non-usable um, um, commodities and use that to attract deer into certain areas uh, so that you can more strategically harvest those and teach people how to do that effectively. Um, making sure people know uh, the boundaries of the properties, where the hiking trails are, 
uh, and really be forced to be familiar with where they're actively hunting uh, to ensure their safe operations uh, and to work around you know, the other community uh, users in those areas, whether they're farm workers, whether they're hikers, whether they're tourists, uh, just making sure that those hunters are, are very mindful uh, of people outside of their hunting party. Um, and so uh, the more in most situations, the more you train people and, and, and screen them, the more competent those individuals will be, right? And so you have to decide how much willingness there is to participate in the program, how much are you able to encourage people to participate, right? Through land access, through a sale of venison, um, through being uh, seen as a um, local community um, uh, kind of volunteer, right? They're helping their neighbors. And, and that's just kind of a feel good benefit uh, because the farmer now can, can maximize their, their profits and, um, and kind of it's a win-win. So, uh, but it is important to note that just checking people for their ability to shoot a firearm is not gonna help them be a better uh, deer hunter, right? They really need training around how to be more productive so that you can meet your management goals. So it is more than just making sure they can shoot their uh, archery tackle or firearms proficiently. Um, it is important to collect data, like you're starting to collect data on observations. You want to know who's out there hunting, where they're hunting, how many animals are harvesting, the age and sex of those animals, right? Use your camera survey data to see if you're having impacts uh, in those areas. Um, and then, you know, really understanding, you know, who these participants are, right? One of the things we focus on when we train people is uh, one of the most important elements is those individuals really understanding their limitations. How skilled are they? How does their, how well is their equipment work? Um, and be mindful of that and then learn to improve those proficiencies where those limitations become uh, less and less impactful on their ability to harvest deer. Um, so we really do uh, need to make sure that people aren't just recreating or having a few deer for the freezer or to sell. Uh, they really need to hunt to actually manage these populations. And if you're not setting that threshold, you'll kill some deer, but you'll never really meet your objectives or minimize those impacts, uh, particularly to your sensitive forest plants. Um, so all those things tie into uh, in integrating these hunters into the community, seeing them as, as an asset to the community versus you know renegades that are out there hunting at night, right? We wanna pull them into that community fold so they are uh, you know accepted and, and, and really appreciated by the rest of the community. Um, so, you know, we would, we do discuss, you know, how to bait animals, how to manipulate those animals, how to be more effective at harvesting those animals, uh, ensuring all the safety considerations, whether that's ammunition or, or, or firearm caliber that's being selected. How do you set these environments up for culling so that you minimize any uh, safety risks um, and make sure folks are out there uh, that have the skill and equipment to, to get the, the most effective outcome. Uh, and we do go through, you know, discussing anatomy and, and how to, you know, place shots to ensure that animals are killed humanely. Um, you know, that is always, a, you know, often a, an important consideration um, when managing deer, particularly around people. You know, they don't want to see injured deer, even if they don't like the deer. Uh, certainly no one wants to see an animal injured, you know, unnecessarily. Um, anyway, tried to keep that short and, and sweet. Um, I think we're opening up for questions later and happy to answer them. Happy to have open dialogue with folks by email or call later. Uh, just hoping I can help um, you know, move your process along where you are able to uh, get the, the legal and, and political elements um, going in the right direction quickly um, so that you can actually get ahead of, of your deer situation uh, before you worry too much about just having data on what's happening, you can pretty much assume that if you don't manage white-tailed deer, they will be decimating your forest in the long run. So there's no need to prove that, you know, before you, you take any action. Anyway, I hope that was helpful and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this webinar. All right, thank you, doctor. That was extremely helpful. I, we, we enjoy seeing it from the foreign perspective, some of the measures that uh, have been put in place and some of the issues that you two have been dealing with. So it's crossing divides, but that was that was really interesting. Now we have all our panelists that they've spoken. 
And now the floor is open to questions. So just raise your hand and I will allow you to talk. And we have our first question. And this will be open to all our panelists, including our legal officer, Mr. Stuart Panton. He's online. So our first question is from a Galaxy Tab A. So when I allow you to talk, please just state your name and your organization, and you can go ahead with your question. Hello. Yes, good morning. I can hear you. Yes, good morning, uh, um, panelists, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rohan McLeod. Um, I am a farmer and a businessman um, from Portland. And um, I kind of joined the, the webinar a little bit late. I um, joined in when the gentleman was speaking about the, the history of um, beer being in Jamaica. Um, there's a lot of, how should I say, versions to the story. But um, most of the stories actually start at Hurricane Gilbert. However, the history is before Hurricane Gilbert. Okay, the first set of deer that escaped from the tourist facility, which I, I'm, I'm not sure if you want to call the name, but I'll leave the facility nameless, um, escaped in actually 1980 when we had Hurricane Allen. Because all of this occurred right in my backyard. Hello? Yeah, yes, 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 yes. We're listening, we're listening. Yeah, all, all, all of this occurred right in my backyard. That was the first set of deer. Then now they brought in another set of deer. This time, they, the first set was just all white tail. When they brought in the second set of deer, they brought in some replenishment for the white tail that escaped, and they also brought in mule deer. There's actually two species of deer here in Jamaica, the white tail and the mule deer. Okay, uh, so, uh, yes. Yes, um, I, I was doing some camera traps earlier with some um, international experts who shared similar concern that there might have been other mule deer that they might have seen mule deer here. Mm -hmm. But um, we haven't confirmed that. So um, as, as I stated in the presentation before, that's why I said um, so far what we had documented was the event after Hurricane Gilbert. But we had information which you are confirmed now before that there were um, other introductions, but we could not verify it. Yeah, man, well... I can, I, can, I can stand by what I just said, because like I said, it happened right in my backyard. Um, you can feel free to, to, to contact me. Um, yes. And I can do well, The mule deer is usually found within a specific area. In other areas, it's like they really don't, they're not, they're, they, they, don't, they don't seem like they wander as much as the white tail. Okay. Right, so we can make some contact and I can take it to the areas where you can, you know, we can have a chance to see the, um, the, the, the mule deer. Um, um, next thing, so that is about the history. Um, pertaining to the whole hunting, because I hunt deer and I hunt wild hog as well, right? I hardly eat other meats. Um, I would say just like with bird hunting, don't open it up where the protected areas are just all free and willy-nilly. Control the access pertaining to hunting of animals within the protected area. Because many times the protected area is where we can, in a nutshell, pro um, protect or have preservation of these species so our future generations can see. Right, so um, that is my take on that. Um, <clears throat> the beauty about our deer here in Jamaica is that so far, thank God, 
we have not found Lyme disease. Right, so um, hopefully, if we are going to say, open it up for permits and the hunting and all of that of, of, that, of deer, um, we might have to be mindful and probably do geographical location if hunters are going to come from overseas to find out if the areas that they are from and they are frequenting hunting may have Lyme disease. Because we would not want Lyme disease to be introduced here into Jamaica. Okay, noted. Thank you, Mr. McLeod. I really like the, the underground experience. And I'm glad I have you some other points. Uh, yeah, I do have some other points, but I'll allow some other persons to, right. to, to have their say, yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. McLeod. And yes, definitely get in touch with with Damien and Roosters World on all the social media channels so that you can Roosters World. Roosters World. And you can also. Mr. McLeod, I'll I, I send you a message. Right. Yeah, ma'am. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Let okay, me have cool. another person that is on. Miss Jodian Johnson. You can go ahead with your question. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, this question is for Mr. Damian White. I am from the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean, um, Jamaica, the University of Texas, Austin, um, within an environmental capacity, as well as the Ministry of Finance, PPC. And Mr. White, given your underground expertise, can you state what methods persons who are affected by said species, the white-tailed deer, or want to prevent movement of the deer can employ within a, you know, civilian capacity? You know, you see the deer and you know that the deer is per pervasive somewhat. What can we do to, you know, prevent, you know, movement? Because you said, you know, there might be the possibility of them moving to, you know, other parishes in Jamaica. Thanks. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a good question to ask what a, a civilian can do. And the, the first thing I would put it, um, the reporting mechanism that we, that have been mentioned before in reaching out to Nepal and reporting okay. that you have seen it. That's the first thing. The second thing is, um, as you heard I mentioned before, we know that some civilian, civilians are catching the deer and bringing it to the right. other. We want to right. encourage people not to do it. Most of okay. our citizens do not have, um, I know a firearm is not readily available in Jamaica and it's very expensive. And mm -hmm. a number of civilians, as Dr. Nicola just showed, um, don't have the training experience in using firearms and all of that. Right. Um, I wouldn't want to tell in civilians they go take up a gun or shoot or do traffic. I think okay. the would be to get in contact with the, the experts. That's the first thing. Right. Um, and that would be one of the things that the management authority would have to come up with a mechanism where the report is done, maybe a local group, and then we have hunters come in that area and, and deal with it. Okay. But in that question that I asked now, letting me think now that, um, yeah, I know people are here and wondering what I can do as an individual. And um, I, I wouldn't want an individual to take up arm and go um, hunt because there is a lot of regulation when it comes to our firearms authority um, right. of what you can do. I am not right. aware of regulations, so right. I, I have to go into that, but there's a lot of their safety and all of that. So I don't want John Brown to take up in action and take arms and go out. Uh, also, okay. there are groups, I'm talking to the environment groups, that are unhappy about the hunting part that we're re recommending for managing the deer. Um, I got people asking me question, can we catch the deer and send it back to North America? Okay. <laughs> That's not an option. Because okay. North America would not want deer from Jamaica. They have their issues too. When you move an animal from another area, you don't know what other pathogen you carry. So there is a lot of risk in that. And I know that's a no, no, no already. But I know 
I have got question that day. It's Bambi, it's beautiful. You know, Jamaican <laughs> it and uh, what and Santa's um Yeah. Pulling, reindeers. Like that. Yeah, pulling reindeers. So yeah. from that aspect, I would just tell um people for right now, if you are not a hunter, no. we never, never reach out or if there's a hunting group in the community mm -hmm. that are working. Because for example, in Portland you have um well, I would say you have um different hunting club there, but you also have community members that right. hunt. And one of the social things that I, I never mentioned here, but it's something that I have to deal with. When you talk about firearms, some of the local view it, say you're bringing a big man. Oh. Uh, you can contest what a big man is. You're bringing okay. in person, and you're not talking about the, the community person. So in part of what Dr. Tony mentioned in his presentation, a while ago in empowering local people and all of that. So setting up those groups and then have the community member know, know who to call because one of the things is in Jamaica, we have a, um, people don't have the information readily. So I see the deer, I see the deer yeah. now, I call this person and this person we call again. So um, Okay, all right, thanks so much. Me. No problem, thank you very much. We have one more question from uh, Jenny Daltrey. Ms. Hello. Daltrey? Hi, good morning. Good, good morning. morning. Um, I, I work for um, Rewilds and Fauna and Flora International in the Caribbean, uh, and we support a number of uh, projects around the Caribbean um, to conserve wildlife and including managing invasive species. Uh, one question, I, I'm not an expert on deer, so one question I have is, is I actually have two questions. The first is, you talked about trying to assess, you know, where are the deer, you know, are they getting into the protected areas? Um, you mentioned trail cameras as, a, as an option, but can you not simply identify the deer from droppings? You know, if, if, if rangers and others on the ground can recognize the droppings, can they use those to reliably inform you that the deer are there or are there other species there that those could be confused with? That's the first question. The second is really, you know, we've had some really useful talks about the problems they may cause, the methodologies, but what, what do you think your goals will be? Um, you know, the deer seem to be spreading, increasing in number. Does Jamaica want to control that spread and just hold the line and just say, okay, they're here now, but we don't want them spreading any further. Do you want to actually reduce the numbers in those areas or some of those areas? Do you want to even eradicate them from some areas? Um, I'm, I'm interested to know what, you know, given there's obviously a lot of different views here, what what you think the goals of your program are going to be, because that may help them determine what methods and strategies. Okay, so so let's answer the first question. So in the presentation, the first paper um, that was carried out on the deer in Jamaica, they did the droppings, and basically um, you ask a question: if there are species that can be confused, the deer dropping. To a non-expert eyes, they might can confuse it with a goat dropping. But if you know the deer, it's uh, like a pea, like a, a red pea, black. It, it's easy to differentiate. However, the problem now that we have in this area is that in Portland is one of the areas where you have the highest rainfall in Jamaica. One of the areas, one time they have one of the highest, in Millbank area had the highest rainfall reported in the world once. So there's a lot of rainfall. So it can be done, but there are some limitations in terms of the dropping. Now, if you empower um, rangers and community members in using the, um, what, using signs such as the um, leave, I see some of the hunters show me um, the tracks. Some of the guys were pretty good. Although, you know, sometimes to prove it scientifically, um, there's some limitation in it, but there, you can use the, the tracks and you can, can use the dropping, but when you have the rain factor to it, it becomes complication. So that's why I know we are pushing stuff like um, the camera chat. Um, with Dr. Tournaments and spotlighting, we try spotlighting in some areas, but other than the trail, it was difficult to see in the, the forest. So um, if we empower rangers, yes. The second question where you asked about the management strategy. So in the invasive species um, working group, I think we had a drop our management strategy. And when we look at the management strategy, um, eradication, for example, in Portland, um, 
did not look like it would be practical because there are some areas, as a doctor Tony mentioned, it's going to be very difficult to reach. We can get it to some acceptable level. And right now we're working on setting that goal that you mentioned. However, if it moved to new areas, like as I mentioned, St. Elizabeth, where we have like a peak in agriculture, um, like with crops, we'd want to eradicate it from new areas. But we already have it that it is something that we might have to live with in, for example, in Portland. We, we have to. So in new areas, we want to eradicate. Um, our friend, um, Mr. McLeod, mentioned a while ago in his presentation, um, his interest as a hunter in the sense that um, would want the population to be regulated in a way that you would have more white tail deer. But he might be, his, um, what well, I should say, um, his understanding might be a little bit different from the, the environmentalists because I should say from um, how the invasive species working group looking at it, because if we have our population within the protected area, the Blue and Dranka Mountain have several endemic plants, which are found, you know, which are some of them might be even endemic to that region, meaning it's found nowhere else in the world. And we are not, we don't have right now from the university standpoint, we don't, as one of my supervisors always tell me, we don't have a point person doing research there. When I go down there, I do visits, go out with community members and they'll, they'll tell me stuff. But we don't have anybody down there documenting the plants or what is being lost or the current status. But from the papers, we know that damage is going on. And right now, you might even check um, the, 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 the reports and you might hear that there's no reports of the deer in the national park. But if you go inside, I can step over to the boundary of the national park and I can step back in the area where the deer, there's no barrier. And this animal, as a doctor told you, will tell you, travel for kilometers. So we already can assume that they are in the park. So we have to, um, to, to, to come up with measures now in trying to get that numbers down before it really, because the paper that I've been showing you that it have a negative impact on the forest. And if we are not monitoring or doing that, so all of that now, and in part of having this webinar is to help guide that um, management strategy. We did, we did do a draft, but in the draft, we weren't talking about the social issues that Dr. Tony mentioned. Um, because right now, personally, I believe if the if some management is not put into it and you have so much social issues going on, then we might have some negative impacts coming out of it. And um, this webinar is help putting it to our, um, what I should say, our team in help guiding um, the management strategy because the deer is new to us. But with experts like Dr. Tony, they have been doing a lot of study. And one point that he said that I agree with him, we have to put, we have to make sure that the research that we are doing is in line with the management strategy. We have a thing here, we're waiting on the research. The research guide the management strategy, but we have some literature already that tells the impact that it will be doing on our first. So we have to act now. All right, thank you, Ms. Daltrey. Thank you for mm -hmm. your question. We have two other questions. Uh, Ms. Cara Whitfield and then um, Anne. Ms. Whitfield, you're on the board, yes. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm located in Portland and I do have deer on my property, but I'm not looking to uh, kill the deer or eradicate the deer. Um, I am vegan and recently I've started um, farming and I've noticed that they have been nibbling on the leaves of the plants. So is there any guidance towards living with the deer and somehow or is there any deterrent of the deer things that could be placed so that they don't try to eat your crops or is there a particular sort of fence that could be built i've seen things online where people use fishing wire um 
you know, to make a fence to keep the deer out. Um, so that's my concern because I don't want anybody coming on my property um, hunting deer. Yes, Dr. Anthony, you, the floor is yours. Hi, Kara. Um, Hi. Uh, appreciate your questions. So I've done extensive research all the way back to the late 80s. Um, looking at repellents, um, different fencing methods. And so in situations where um, you, know, you can't afford to, to tolerate the deer's presence, and it is more of a, a gardening or, or small farming situation. Um, and if you plan on doing this long-term, then I would strongly suggest putting up a fence. And whether that's a woven wire fence uh, or some type of more persisting um, uh, material so that you're not every year having to deal with this. If it's spotty and you're only growing crops at small intervals, you can use portable electric fences. Um, but mm -hmm. ultimately what happens is the deer abundance escalates to the point where um, a lot of repellents and or electric fencing no longer becomes effective, right? They become more hungry. You have a nice garden uh, or farm crops on the other side of, of the fence and they're more persisting. So it kind of, in the long term, it's very hard and difficult to keep deer out um, as the populations increase. So if, if not gonna be any active management anywhere in the area um, where you reside, then you're gonna wanna build a, a fairly robust fence. And, and I would suggest a, a woven wire fence that will last you know, many years. So every year you're not going out trying to do a patchwork of, of, um, of materials. Okay, thank you. And just one follow up on that. Um, I got anecdotal information from some of the farmers who tried using dogs. No, the dogs are effective in chasing them out when they come in, but when they just chain the dogs to the property, the deer worked out how far um, the dog could go and they would eat the crops to that area. And the dog, <laughs> would go. um, they are very smart. Well, that's why they're persons, they're very smart. So, I mean, um, we, we, I think it's, it's something that now has to be put to the, the government in, in pushing, um, or maybe rather, I mean, agriculture that in funding more research in that area. Although, as you can see from Dr. Anthony, that tell you from his research that whatever you put in, you have to be changing, changing because the animal is smart. So, it might work today and tomorrow you come up with something. But I do understand and that why we like having a meeting like this because as I was mentioned to a number of stakeholders, not everybody wants everybody on their property. And I'm very glad that you asked that question, Kara. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, Kara. Let us move on to Anne. Uh, yes, yes, very, very, very interesting presentation. Um, I just wanted to re-emphasize what Damien has said that we really have an urgent need to take action. We've been talking about this for many, many years and nothing has been done. This is a constant pattern in terms of how Jamaica deals with invasive species. We first of all, we ignore them and then it, it become a problem and then we research it and then we do nothing. Um, and I, I think um, this is somewhat something where the implications for our agriculture for our farmers i mean the idea that that people are going to have to put um 10 foot high chain link fences around their gardens if they want to keep the deer out um the cost to to our farmers is is huge and if it spreads to other areas um then that's it's a, it's a, really is a disaster i'm not sh convinced how well we can um, take action to eradicate them if they spread to other areas, but we should certainly try. And we need to have a task force and an immediate, um, fi find funding immediately to, to be ready that if somebody says, as people have said, that there may be um, deer in Clarendon, that we can, we have a trained party of, of licensed hunters or who can actually go out and, and get rid of these things at a very early stage. But the whole pattern of, with, with invasive species is of course that they stay at a very low level where it's almost impossible to, to control them. And then when you've got enough species that everybody sees there's a problem, it's too late. Anyway, we need to take some urgent action. Um, 
And I just wondered um, from Dr. Anthony, like you you very strongly emphasized um, using firearms and trained hunters, but there's many issues with that for Jamaica. So I wondered to what extent you think that um, training people to, to use traps or maybe improving trap technology, and it is something that people um, can can use if they don't, you know, apart from um, licensed hunters and whether we could have a, a team of trained trappers um, that 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 could at least carry out some of these these um, activities. And the the other one more question, a technical one, which I don't know the answer to. Um, camera traps are expensive. Um, do they make any calls that we could use sound recordings to because um, that would be much cheaper. Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Um, so the problem with trapping is you need to have an attractant to bring the animal into the trap. And I suspect in Jamaica, you have at this point a tremendous abundance of vegetation giving the climate and the rainfall. So having what we call bait leverage to attract an animal into a trap will be pretty minimal. Um, so you could catch some animals, but it'll be a very small percentage of the overall population. And even here in the States in our winter with snow on the ground, um, to Damon's point, you know, deer are very smart. And so you catch a couple on a trap and then they learn to avoid them. And so trapping just doesn't have the ability to keep uh, animal, well, at least deer, um, especially in a, in, a, in a climate and environment like Jamaica, you'll never keep those densities low enough either to protect forest health or agricultural interests. Um, camera traps are actually, well, I guess relative to your budget, you know, you can get reasonably good cameras, you know, the old school not with cell networks for about $80 a piece. Um, we run hundreds of them every year uh, and eventually they, they fatigue, but you know, they're weatherproof. And, um, you know, and so you can get a good amount of data collection for a reasonably low cost. You know, if you compare it to labor costs, the cost of the camera is actually pretty insignificant. But do, do they have any identifiable calls? Uh, no, not, nothing that they're, they're not a vocal um, ungulate. So realistically, um, there's nothing that you would be able to regularly you know, pick out of the landscape to detect presence or absence. Thanks. Uh, just one quick question there. I just got a message from a hunter to Dr. Um, to um, Mr. Panton, I put in this. He's here asking um, about hunting in protected area and getting himself in trouble. And he's asking if in the future, um, what's the possibility of allowing that in our protected area, if the deer is there? Um, well, the possibility of doing it. Uh, well, the truth is, I, I know we're having internal discussions with regards to, um, you know, how we're going to manage this issue of the white deer. Uh, uh, the white tail deer. Uh, there, as far as having people go and hunting in a protected area, uh, similar to what you had, you had spoken to earlier, Damien, with regards to the um, the lionfish um, issue, it may come up again. However, for right now, I am not in a position where I can say yes for sure. Give us a year, we'll allow you to hunt in the protected areas. That's I can just say it's an ongoing discussion that we're having. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Justin Tapper and then Mr. McLeod. He has raised his hand again. So let's. All right, Mr. Tapper. Justin Tapper from the University of the West Indies. Um, my question is that, is there any other impact seen on the environment and the agriculture in Jamaica? Justin, could you ask the question? Justin, is the question I asking if we see any impact on the agriculture? 
on environment? Yeah, other than that, what, what was stated previously? Um, well, the, the thing is, um, I've mentioned, um, we currently we have done some few studies have been carried out on the deer. As I mentioned, Chai did some studies. I have gone down there and did some work. And Nepa has gone down there and given questionnaires to get information of sightings. And I think some reports have gone to Rada, um, Rada um, where the farmers report what's going on the farm. The typical stuff, and then farmers contact me on social media. So as I mentioned, in terms of agriculture, it's the cash crops and they love carrot when it's ready. When they plant the yam heads, they hit the yam heads. Um, so that's like the two bars are hitting them. Um, one of the interesting stuff that I found out though, they were saying that when the crops are in season, then the number of their activity are present increase, which shows you that they move. So um, in terms of that, we know that it affects the, the agriculture. There was this big concern, and I'm glad Mr. McLeod mentioned it, where people um, just imagine at the time that they, the deer came in earlier years, they didn't have strict regulations from the environment in terms of you have to do certain health. Um, you'd have to check all the health, the diseases, the pathogen the deer had. I don't think at that time we were that stringent like who we are now. So there, in the scientific group, people were concerned if there were some diseases there. Um, this can only be answered by vets and stuff like that. But so far we haven't heard, we haven't heard about Lyme disease here or other stuff, but we're not sure who doing it. So there was this worry, people were wondering if you have wild animals near to our farm animals, if they had a disease to pass over. So we have no reports on that. So in terms of agriculture, it would affect the crops and there would have been a risk to livestock. When it goes over to the environment now, we have not done a detailed study. So far, if you check the literature, as I said, they are not reported in the, the protected area, but we know there's no bias, so they are there. But we don't have any information on what plants they're eating or stuff like that, or wild trap. We don't. Um, are we doing studies? No. We don't have anybody owning it. We don't have anybody funding that, and we need to move towards that. However, we have, had, we have enough information from the literature to see the other countries that is uh, um, impacted to make correlation and know that we can develop a management strategy to a point before we can go back and let the literature guide it. And then the last thing, as Dr. Anson mentioned, when it comes to invasive species, you have to act now. You can't wait a year or two. I mean, they are spreading. Whether we like it or not, I mean, we are do, the first time we did this talk, it was around summer said fall when it just escaped. Maybe if we put in enough energy, it would not have spread to where it is now. It is going over to St. Thomas. And we know and we know that I know that people are carrying them around the place. We don't know if they have escaped. And our hands are tied because we can't stop somebody from carrying it to another area. If this really gets away, you know, a bread basket and a population is set up, it will cost us millions of dollars. Because when you hear what some of the farmers complain about, I understand some people might be happy to go out there and hunt. And yes, there are benefits, but you have to weigh both of them. So for example, like the Invasive Species Committee, we are looking at the environment. We're also looking at the agriculture. While on the other side, the communities might be benefited out of that, but then you have to look at the greater good. So there is a lot of discussion that we have to have. I understand what uh, Mr. Panton said about the protected area, but just remember that the deer don't know a protected area. So one way or the other way, we have to find a solution quick to that. And we have to, um, Dr. Sutton mentioned something that we don't want to mention. In Jamaica, it's not, it's very difficult for a normal man to get a firearm because it is expensive. Plus we have a crime culture. So putting all of that together, it is very tricky with the firearm thing. And it's something that we have to deal with. Two, um, and we have to come up with different measures to guide the management strategy. But one point I can tell you, the longer we take to act, the more the problem will get bigger. All right, thank okay, you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Damien. And let's, 
um, go back to Mr. McClough for his quick comment. Okay, um, good morning again. Um, I just want to first thank all of the panelists for sharing your wealth of knowledge and it is greatly appreciated. And um, I fully agree that action, serious action is required. The population out there, I would say is more than what is reported because they have a wide array of vegetation to choose from. They have favorable weather. And even during the times when I am used to, when I'm hunting in the States and, and all that stuff, and you would now know that, okay, this is the season for when the deer would reproduce. I am noticing that in Jamaica, they're not, re they not reproducing on any season. Right? Um, next thing about what uh, Mr. White mentioned about the competency. I used to do organized hunts with persons who have firearms. I am connected to a shooting range. So what I usually do, I usually take them to the shooting range and test their competency to see how accurate they are, to see how skillful they are. And then I advise them accordingly. Right? Um, since the new FLA rules have come into place, that has changed the whole demographics of using a firearm. That is a no-no. Right? So for years now, I have stopped using firearms and only using traps and other methods. But um, serious action is required. Very serious action is required. And even as Mr. Pantan mentioned, um, looking at the whole thing about the protected areas is something that has to be added to the mix as well. How? Because they can be quite devastating. Just think of a donkey with a combination of a goat. They can be very devastating. They can go up high and totally rip down a tree and they can behave like a goat and just eat everything down to ground. They can be devastating. Another thing that we could look at, if they, if they do venture now into the protected areas, could we look at doing um, selected commercial farming of the deer, where they are captured and brought to an area that is properly set up, and that person can do commercial farming of the deer. So that's my two cents that I want to add now. So Mr. White, Mr. Panton, or Mr. Tony, if you want to reply to that. Dr. Tony, I pass over here. I really don't have much experience there. The, um, I guess all part of this conversation, and hence why we have Mr. Panton on uh, and his involvement with legal aspects. I mean, you need to structure a program like this so you can get um, capable and interested parties involved and they would have an exemption either for the possession and utilization of a firearm relative to deer management uh, and access to whether they're government or park properties. And so that would all have to be integrated into the legal aspects of developing the program so that folks um, specifically tied to the, the, the deer management um, program would have those exemptions, right? You could possess, utilize, you could be in these particular properties. Uh, you have a, a specific license associated with those certifications, certifications or licenses. So uh, it really is kind of a holistic approach to kind of, you know, not just, hey, any hunter can have a firearm or they can't have a firearm. You really need to have a package in place uh, and not only the, the equipment allocations, the methods and the, and the skill levels, um, like Mr. McLeod um, mentioned, you know, there, there are people that have these skills. We need to identify them uh, and bring them into the fold. So it, it's kind of a unified effort. Um, and as far as, you, you know, uh, there's, there's interest on, every, when you talk about deer, everyone has an opinion, right? Uh, I can guarantee you, you can ask anyone on the street, probably even in Jamaica, 
and they're going to have an opinion about a deer, whether they love them, they hate them, they want to hunt them, uh, they want to relocate them, they want to, you know, make jerk out of them, right? Everyone has an interest. And so uh, from a farming perspective, deer farming, um, bad idea. Um, we have it in the U.S. and uh, it is the primary reason why we have chronic wasting disease spread now in almost every U.S. state. Um, you end up with illegal transport between those facilities. Um, you know, so you have infected deer that aren't obviously infected uh, because of the lapse in, in, um, in um, symptoms that are being witnessed and they shift the deer across the landscape. Now you bring it into another deer farm, that disease is transmitted. It takes a while for that to be noticeable. It's already established. You have deer on the outside of the fence, you know, making contact with deer on the inside of the fence. And so, um, you know, that's been a huge problem for us. And more importantly, y'all are going to have hurricanes until everyone on this call is no longer on the planet and beyond. And so any fence you build is not going to last in Jamaica. Um, and so you're <laughs> always going to have breaches to these systems um, in a way that is going to continue risks of, of introducing deer back into the landscape. So um, I do think... I will guarantee you have a lot of deer on your landscape. If, if Mr. McLeod's new deer were getting out in the 1980s uh, and then another repeat event possibly in the early 90s, that's 30 years ago. Um, you know, Damon's graph was was pretty accurate. It may not grow that fast. I mean, there's a lot of theory there, but, but you've got thousands of deer out there. And so if you huh? systematically um, put together a program, we have people like Mr. McLeod that's competent and conscientious, I'd like to believe, and his colleagues and other identified parties, you can be effectively and efficiently harvesting these deer uh, and solving the problem and not increasing the risk of the additional problems by putting uh, deer in another captive facility. So I think it's really something where you need a, a strategic plan that involves the legal aspects, the political aspects, uh, integration of, 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 of capable Jamaicans uh, that can be trained additionally to their existing skill sets and, uh, and you can have a win-win situation. Uh, just like any issue that I've dealt with, uh, it takes leadership, right? It takes the right person in the right position to say, this is a serious issue. Um, pull together a team of folks like Damon and, and, and Stuart um, that say, hey, this is what we need to do to get this type of program off the ground and then drive it forward. Without leadership, you know, everything flounders and there's just a lot of conversations, right? And, and so, and that's kind of the message I was hearing from, from Ann, you know, there's a lot of talk, but no one really moves forward on solving the problems. Um, Ms. Miller, before you close, just give you the two questions from social media. Um, somebody report that they know of somebody raising deer in St. James. This is new to us now. Um, next question that was being asked, if the deer feeding other animals food in the area. Another question, are the deer, um, Mr. Galaxy Top, there? Yeah, I think, right. The next question, is the deer feeding, affecting other animal food in the area? Are the deer prey to other animal? Another person asks, are the deer threats to human? Will they attack people? And the last one was, in the US, we know of motor vehicle accidents involving deer. Is that a concern for us in Jamaica? Okay, that's quite a few questions. Um, we can answer them as quickly as possible and take the last question from a Philili. I'm sorry for the mispronunciation of your name. So we can address those questions very quickly and then the last question. Right, so the first one is the deer feeding affecting other animal food in the area. Um, there's the abundance of vegetation in the area right now, so we don't think it is, but no study has been carried out. Are the deer prey to other animals? We don't have any big predators of the deer in Jamaica. The only predator is humans. And as I mentioned, the schoolworm, which we had reached far in eradicating it, but they don't really have any predator. Are the deer a threat to humans? Will they attack person like... Um, Dr. Anthony, they're not a threat. I don't want to hear they're attacking. They're not a threat to humans. So. We do. Um, in, the, in our suburban environments, if you have an abundance of deer that can acclimate it to people, 
we do have occasional incident during the breeding season when the males are, are much more aggressive um, where you might see a human interaction, infrequent. Um, but what we see more frequently is humans um, with their dog or even on their own trying to pick up a fawn um, and then the doe will attack them and kick them um, trying to defend their fawn. Um, these are small, low incidents, you know, but become more prevalent as you have more deer and more deer in the neighborhoods or, or you know, in areas like where Carol lives, where she has, um, you know, her residence in, in a small, a small farm. So you start seeing, you know, and people are curious, they want to pick up a fawn, it's cute. And, uh, and then the female comes out. <laughs> but, uh, but these are, these are minor and incidental matters, you know, in the big picture. Okay, and the final question, in the US, we know a motor vehicle accident. Um, Dr. Anthony did put in his presentation where he was showing a motor vehicle accident. In terms of with Jamaica, based on some of the hunting um, ways that we use, in, like the dogs chasing the deer across the road, we can have, um, we can have incident, especially with how we drive on the road. So that could be, yeah, it could affect it. I know, leave it to Miss Miller, our final question, because I know people are busy, so we can wrap up. Yes. All right. You miss or Philili? <laughs> Apologies for the mispronunciation. You can go ahead with your question. Hello, Miss Philili. Hello. I think you need to unmute. She is unmuted. Hello? Yes, yes we now we you. can hear you. Okay, so good morning. I'm Karen Barnett from the University of the West Indies. And I was wondering if we could use the deer population to our advantage where we could probably use them to control invasive species, plant species? Um, all right, so... The, the thing is, from the, the studies that we have, um, the deer eat a number of invasive species, but by doing it, they are spreading the seeds. So it would be like, just imagine planting seeds with fertilizer. So they eat the native stuff and spread like grass and some other, other invasive. So into that, in, in that sense, we would not be getting an advantage, it would be a disadvantage. So um, we couldn't use it in that way um, right now. Because remember, it's a herbivore, and it would be going in there and eat all the small plants. And as I mentioned, in the Blue and Drunk of Mountain National Park, we have a number of endemic plant species, some which are found only in that area. Some not even reported to science as yet. So um, that would be the answer to your question. And... In wrapping up that, I just want to add something that somebody put to me on social media that I wasn't thinking about. Um, they were mentioning that with some of the hunting thing, they have um, wild dogs like in the forest or in the protected area. If we recall how the Jamaica iguana was found, was basically some hunters in there, a wild, uh, sorry, a hunting dog catch an iguana, it was damaged, they brought it to UA, and that was the starting of the iguana project. In some of the areas like the park, we have very interesting animals like the coney, the hutia, which are endemic. And I need to check if it's endangered. It's an endangered species list. So when we have wild dogs and stuff like that, so if we increase hunting, I know people might increase carrying dogs and stuff. Another secondary impact, like going after the coney or other local species, uh, is an indirect impact of some of the activities. And the reason why I mentioned, I'm just trying to show you the reason why I have to think this too, because by implementing something, you're bringing a new risk, which could affect the wildlife. I mean, I've been getting some good pointers on social media and the WhatsApp, and I would like to tell people thanks. So, um, answer your question, Miss Felili, and I hope you'll be one of the research young researchers that might take up the charge of doing research. Um, and the deer, because we need an owner. And Dr. Anthony, we need somebody, we need a researcher. I am not the researcher, I'm not the deer man. We need a deer man or a deer woman, right, to be there. Um, and in Jamaica, anyway, you get a project, 
um, to be carried out. You need somebody to own it. I remember the Swallowtail project here, Dr. Gary that led it. You had the, the Iguana project, Dr. Peter Vogel and Professor Wilson. We need an owner for the deer. So we need some young researchers like you, take it up the post grant. And we need um, Mr. Pantan and the NEPA, the Imaginary Authority to um, come with, uh, to improve on the management strategy. And we need people to understand that we do have a problem. Personally, as a scientist, I don't feel that we, we see it as a problem. And that, pe that why members of the IS group, like Dr. Hans Sutton, that I'm we talk a lot, but it's about five, 10 years and we don't see any action. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Damien. All right. This brings to an end our white tailed deer session for Nepal Connects. I want to thank all our panelists. I am going to share our Instagram page. And this page, we're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at NEPA Jamaica. So that's N-E-P-A Jamaica, where you can get all the information you need about all of the environmental issues, including the white tail there. We have quite a number of infographics on the white tail there that you can appraise yourself of. So now I want to hand over to Miss Anika Grant. She'll be doing the vote of thanks she's the environmental she's an environmental officer at the agency and her branch is responsible for the management of invasive alien species miss grant hi good afternoon one and all are you able to hear me yes what an informative session i would like to express sincere gratitude to our panelists our presenters, Mr. Damian White and Dr. Tony, all our stakeholders, colleagues, and every other person that joined us today. Let us all join hands and heart to control the spread of the invasive white tail deer in Jamaica and to minimize their impacts on biodiversity. Thanks again, one and all. Do enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Bye, everybody. All right, bye. bye.